Okay, so when we say instantaneous uh, rate of change, of course, that implies calculus. But uh, as we saw in the warm-up, we don't even have to really say instantaneous uh, for you all to infer that the rate of change means at a point. Typically because if we say find the rate of change at x equals or at t equals, that is a single moment in time, so we can infer it's instantaneous. Whereas if it says find the rate of change over an interval, that would be average rate of change. So example four is kind of uh, interesting uh, in, in light of the um, Nikki Haley situation where she stepped down as the UN head to, uh, as we learned over lunch, possibly to make a run to the 2020 presidency. Um, this is about a president. So in October 1996, okay, that was um, just a couple of months before I graduated college, in the issue of um, Notices of the AMS, which it's a magazine that actually at UT when I was there, we actually got. So I, I actually remembered reading this article. Okay? Hugo Rossi, the, the contributing writer, wrote, and here's him quoting from the magazine, in the fall of 1972. Okay, so you all are with me already? So it's 2018. In the issue from 1996, he's referring to 1972. Okay, good. In the fall of 1972, President Nixon announced, and here it is, that the rate of increase of inflation was decreasing. The rate of increase of inflation was decreasing. And um, whether he meant that just uh, as, you know, some political message that it was meant to just confuse the public or confound the public, or whether he actually knew what he was talking about, Rossi notes that this was the first time, to his recollection or his research, where a sitting president used the third derivative to advance his cause for re-election. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, I already did part A. Yeah. Um, so explain what Rossi meant, all right? Nixon was referring to the third derivative. Why is it the third derivative? The rate of increase of inflation was decreasing. You all understand? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? It's a good thing? The rate of, so inflation is on the rise. Okay, so if we just graph inflation, that vague concept of inflation, it's increasing at a decreasing rate. Yes? Increasing at a decreasing rate. So are we always going to have inflation? I guess so. Is inflation always going to be on the rise? I guess so. If it's going to happen, I guess at a decreasing rate would be preferred to at an increasing rate, yes? So why is that the third derivative? Because if you say how something is changing, you're talking about its first derivative. And then if you say that it's changing at a decreasing rate, you're talking about the slope's rate of change, which would be the second derivative. Where does the third derivative come in? Very good. Inflation itself is already a rate of change. So if you back it up from here, what does inflate, what, what, does anyone kind of have a working definition of inflation? Value of, money. value of money. Good. Value of money. That's a great way to say it. The value of money. Uh, you could also kind of substitute purchasing power if you want. Kind of all related. Purchasing power. And uh, inflation implies what? An increase or decrease? Well, yeah, I mean, however you want to look at it. Inflation, you know, if you're inflating a balloon, you're making it bigger. But if, if uh, inflation, if we have inflation, the value of money is typically less, right? So that, that's, that's what he meant. Inflation is itself a rate of change of value of money or purchasing power. And it is increasing, um, at a decreasing rate. So third derivative, right? Purchasing power, first derivative would be inflation, second derivative would be on the rise, that would be kind of the acceleration, and third derivative would be um, kind of like the jerk function that we talked about uh, with position, velocity, acceleration, and jerk function. So uh, yeah, Nixon was referring to the jerk function, right? A lot of people then thought at one point that Nixon was in fact a jerk when he denied, um, of course, the Watergate scandal. And now 
even though the hotel was called Watergate, into which, uh, you know, his people allegedly broke, people now refer to any scandal as whatever gate, right? So anyway, it's become, I guess, part of our social lexicon. Inflate gate. Ah, oh, inflation gate. We can have Brady with inflate gate, and uh, this could be inflation gate. Okay, sweet. All right. Well done, inflate gate. Um, so here's a quick summary from the definitive source of all knowledge, right? Wikipedia, the modern library of Alexandria. Okay. Um, but with more fire protection, right? It's all on servers that are backed up. Since inflation itself is derivative, the rate at which the purchasing power of money decreases. Then the rate of increase of inflation is the derivative of inflation or the second derivative of the function of purchasing power of money with respect to time. Stating that a function is decreasing is equivalent to stating that its derivative is negative. So Nixon's statement is that the second derivative of inflation or the third derivative of purchasing power is negative. Yeah, so um, that could be a good thing, right? It could be a good thing to the alternative. Orwellian twist. Ooh, Newspeak. Have you all read 1984? It's a must read if you haven't read it. Nixon's statement actually allowed for the rate of inflation to increase. So in actuality, his statement was not as indicative of the stable prices that he was trying to make it sound. Okay? It was just political doublespeak. Nonetheless, Nixon did go on to win the general election over George McGovern with 60.7% of the popular vote. And then, of course, he stepped down from the presidency before he was impeached. Because the Watergate scandal. Okay, good old politics. So there you go. That's a good meme. I made that meme. Isn't that pretty good? It hasn't caught on yet. But I got an A in calculus. Yeah. I got A. There you go. So there you go. Maybe I did that intentionally. Maybe I did that intentionally. He did not get A in English, but he got A in calculus. Okay, so it could use a little bit of work. It could use a little bit of work, but I like it. I like it, yeah. All right, I got A in calculus. Sweet. So I just thought I threw that in there. That was something that I remembered uh, reading about in 1996, and uh, it's kind of interesting, right? So when people, uh, politicians just start, you know, throwing stuff out, you know, or, or even, you know, just political ads or, or, I'm sorry, advertisements of any type, you know, you have to really kind of question the validity of the claims they're making because sometimes it is just double speak and it, it's it's not really intended to be taken um, literally. You know. All right. So moving on here from uh, Nixon uh, and Hugo Rossi, example five. All right. So here we're kind of getting into motion. Imagine a sphere. You got it. Okay. Whose radius is decreasing. Oh boy. All right, so what's happening to the sphere? It's getting smaller. When the diameter of the sphere is six feet, ooh, were we all thinking the sphere that large? Maybe not, so adjust. Uh, with respect to the radius, how fast is the volume of the sphere changing? Explain your results. Okay, so this is kind of a taste of uh, what's going to be later called related rates when we talk about how quantities change with respect to time. Here we're talking about how fast it changes with respect to the, the radius itself. So let's draw a little picture. Oops, that's a bad one. So here is a, a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional sphere. It looks like that. And uh, let me draw the radius here from the center out to here. So we'll call that R. It's changing, so I'll label it little r because it's a variable. Imagine the sphere is decreasing. So what do we know about... Uh, the, the derivative of R, is it positive or negative? Or what would be the, uh, well, I can't even talk about the RDT. Never mind. Uh, when the diameter of the sphere is 6, when the diameter is 6, how fast is the volume changing? So what we need to do then is figure out how we can relate volume V to R in a sphere. Does anyone know the formula? Yeah, pi r cubed is good because it's volume, it's r cubed, and there's pi and it's four thirds. Yeah, so it's four thirds pi r cubed. Uh, memorize that, commit that to memory right now. We're going to be using it later again in the year, but uh, it's one that you need to know, and it's it's not given to you 
if you need it. So you need to have it, you know, able to retrieve it from your own memory. All right, so that is a function of R. The volume is a function of R. So if we want to know how fast the volume is changing with respect to the radius at an instant, right? How do we know this is instantaneous rate of change? Very good. It gives a single point by giving us essentially a single reference point, yeah? A single reference point, and that would be when the diameter is six feet. Well, that's the same thing as saying when the radius is what? Three, okay? So there is the reference point or the moment in time, if you will, that we're referencing. So really what I need to find then, I need to find V prime of three. So that's kind of what we've reduced it to. But before I can find V prime of three, I need to find what? V prime of R. So if I take the derivative of both sides, I get V prime of R. It's a function of R. Or you can write it as dV dr, right? The derivative of V with respect to R, just like dy dx. Dependent variable on top, independent variable on the bottom. And now we can use the power rule, right? So what do we get? Four-thirds times three is four. And then we get pi r squared, pi r squared. Now, for what it's worth, does anyone recognize that formula in terms of spheres? Very good. That is the surface area of a sphere. The derivative of the volume of a sphere, a three-dimensional quantity, gives you the surface area of a sphere, a two-dimensional representation. And it also works with circles. Watch this. If the area of a circle is pi r squared, if I take the derivative of the area, what do I get? 2 pi r, which actually represents the circumference, right, the, the one-dimensional measure of the sphere. So kind of interesting how that works. But right now, I just want to use it as the rate of change of volume. So now, v prime of 3, if I plug it in, it's going to be 4 times pi times 9. And we end up with 36 pi. And now I need to put units, right? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's an application. So what are my units of 36 pi going to be? Uh, yeah, feet per, feet per something, right? Unit of time. Unit of time? Yeah, where, 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 is, where is time in there? Do we even have time reference? Actually, no. So here's, here's, here's another reason Leibniz notation earns its keep, right? So notice I said you could write it as dv dr over there. The way that you would evaluate it is in, in, function, in Leibniz notation, it would be dv dr, and then we use this evaluation bar. And when we did the calculator section, remember, when you hit math 8, this is what comes up, the evaluation bar. And then we put down here at the bottom when r equals 3. So that's kind of like the same thing as v prime of 3. It's just in Leibniz notation. Now, here is why Leibniz notation is preferred, in my opinion. You can look at the numerator and the denominator for assistance with units, right? We're taking the rate of change of volume with respect to a radius. So the units should be units of volume, which is actually cubic feet per units of radius, which is feet, okay? Now, later on, we'll be taking the derivative with respect to time, but right now, it says with respect to the radius. So, uh, we could say then, let's go ahead and write the sentence. I'll just use this space here. When the radius is three feet, comma, the volume is whating. Now this one we kind of did, we kind of cheated because uh, we're actually finding the speed. If it tells us that the radius is decreasing, we kind of know the direction, right? So the volume is going to be what? Increasing or decreasing? Yeah, decreasing. This, we're doing this kind of as a scalar quantity. The volume is decreasing um, by, and here's how we interpret our rate, by 36 pi cubic feet, feet cubed, per foot. So at that single moment, for every one foot that we lose in the radius, we're losing 36 pi cubic feet in the uh, volume, okay? 
36 cubic feet per foot. So notice we could have over here, when we had cubic feet divided by feet, what's cubic feet divided by feet equal to? Feet squared. Do we want to simplify the units, though, in this context? No. I already told you that uh, the derivative is the surface area. So that would mean at that moment the surface area is 36 pi square feet. But that takes it out of the context of what we were looking for, right? We want it still to be cubic feet per foot. So, again, it's just a different way of looking at things. But you could actually say some more stuff here now, right? When the radius is 3 feet, the volume is decreasing by 36 pi cubic feet per foot, and the surface area of the sphere is 36 pi square feet, okay? Square feet. Um, part B, how fast is the surface area changing at that exact same moment? Second derivative. Is that what it's going to be? Yeah, it, it turns out to essentially be the second derivative, because if I then write an equation for the area, I'll use A instead of SA, surface area, uh, it's 4 pi r squared. So that's a function of r, and I want to know how fast it's changing, so I'll take its first derivative, which ends up being the second derivative of volume. Yeah, very good. So if you want to call that V double prime, it's going to end up being area prime, which will be 8 pi r. And now all i got to do is plug in my input, which is what? Same moment in time, which is when the radius is 3. So A prime of 3. Or in Leibniz notation, dA dr evaluated at r equals 3. Means the exact same thing. We plug it in, and we get 24 pi. And what are the units? Leibniz notation helps us out. Square feet per foot, all right? Feet squared per foot, feet squared per foot. So again, you can add that to the sentence. At the moment, the surface area is 36 pi square feet, but it is decreasing by 24 pi square feet for every foot, all right? What would that, if, if, if the derivative of volume was surface area, the derivative of surface area should give us the one-dimensional measure of a sphere. What would that look like? We can we, we understand surface area. What would the one-dimensional measure of a sphere be? I don't know. It would it, it would almost have to be like you're taking. Yeah, something like that. It's it's not quite that because it's still a three-dimensional thing to start with, but it, it's hard to conceptualize. But mathematically, it exists. It's kind of like the fourth dimension. It's not time. What is the fourth dimension? Well, it's hard for us to visualize it. Uh, but mathematically, you can do calculations with any number of dimensions, and it works out. So you don't always get to visualize things, but you know it's there. Okay. Um, how fast is the diameter of the sphere changing at that exact same moment? Well, just like we've been doing, we want to start off with an equation that relates the diameter, in this case, to the radius like we did with the area to the radius and the volume. So I'll use big D for the diameter since Dallas isn't using it. The Cowboys, right? You think Garrett's going to make it? I don't know. The diameter big D is what in terms of the radius? 2R. Good. So uh, the derivative then, big D prime, or DDDR, if you want to write it in Leibniz notation, is what? It's a constant. It's 2. It's two. So uh, the diameter is changing at a constant rate for any size of the radius. So we'll just say this, um, d prime of, we still could use our input, right, when the radius is 3. You could still say d prime of 3 or d d d r when r equals 3 equals 2. And what would the units of that be? Foot per foot, yeah, foot per foot. Not every day you get units of foot per foot, right? Maybe someone kind of you're teaching them a dance, and maybe they follow you foot per foot, right? But not units of foot per foot. And we certainly don't want to divide those out, right? Because then we'd have no units. So then we would be saying, uh, when the radius is 3 feet, comma, the diameter is decreasing by 2 
Yeah, so we don't want to divide them out. See, because then we run into that problem. And I could actually hold my breath a little bit longer, not to brag or anything, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, but not much longer. All right. So any questions on that? All right. Well, let's summarize then. Memorize. The volume of a sphere, the volume of a sphere, V, is four-thirds pi r cubed. Got it? The surface area of a sphere is its derivative with respect to r, 4 pi r squared. Now, you all already know the area of a circle, hopefully, is pi r squared, and its circumference is 2 pi r. And then here's one, the shape of a sphere, round. Okay? Memorize. Memorize. Spherical, yeah, that would be probably better. Round is kind of a generic term. It almost implies two dimension, right? Which Guy Irving apparently uh, used to pretend to believe in, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to box that up, right? That's such good information. Let's box up the round. Thing, right? Okay, good. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get to this. We're not going to get to work a problem, but there's some excellent information in here. And then tomorrow we'll move forward with this. Um, we've already seen this, right? The second derivative of position is the first derivative of velocity, which is instantaneous acceleration, where s in general is the position function. So again, if we're moving on a horizontal line, we'll typically call it x of t. If we're moving on a vertical line, we typically call it y of t. Uh, but in general, we could use s for stada, the Greek uh, root for mile, distance. All right, so how do we find displacement on an interval from A to B? Now, first of all, when we say from A to B, remember it's an interval, so A has to be less than B. All right, we know that. Displacement is your net change in position, your net change in position. So it's your final position minus your initial, final minus initial. Very important, okay? Um, the distance traveled is not the same as displacement. They're only the same if you're traveling in the positive direction. That's the only time the displacement and the distance traveled are the same. If I was traveling one way in the negative direction, they're not the same anymore. Because now my displacement would be negative, and the distance traveled is a positive number. But if you're moving in both directions, positive and negative, then your total distance traveled is the sum of the absolute value of the distances you traveled or your displacements between turning points, right? So I go three steps this way, I turn around, four steps that way, turn around again, two steps this way. That's going to be nine total units, right? I find my displacement in each direction, absolute value them, and add them together. We'll be doing those calculations. All right, if you take your displacement and you divide it by the elapsed time, you get, of course, your average velocity. That's your difference quotient. That's the slope of the secant line. That's still fair game, but that doesn't require calculus. Your instantaneous velocity, of course, is S prime and it's the slope of the tangent line. If you're ever asked to find the speed and you're given the velocity equation, then it's just the magnitude of the number. So it's the absolute value of that number. Um, this is pretty important. You're going to be asked quite a bit if speed is increasing or if speed is decreasing. All right? So I'll point this out before we start. Speed being a scalar quantity, you have to look at two things if speed is increasing. You have to look at the sign of the velocity and the sign of the acceleration. So it's real easy to remember. If the velocity and the acceleration have the same sign, both positive or both negative, imagine them then working together, like running with a tailwind. What's going to happen if you run with a tailwind? It's going to boost you a little bit, right? And speed should be increasing. So if your velocity and acceleration are both positive or both negative at that x value, then the speed is increasing at that x value. But to the contrary, if your velocity and acceleration are opposite signs, one's positive and one's negative or vice versa, it's like running into a headwind. They're working against each other and speed is going to be decreasing. Okay. So to determine if speed is increasing or decreasing, you need to check two things. The sign of what and what? Velocity and acceleration, sorry. But to determine if velocity, which is a vector, is increasing, all you need to do is check the sign of the acceleration, okay? Velocity is increasing when its derivative acceleration is positive, and velocity is decreasing when its derivative acceleration is negative, okay? 
We'll pick up there tomorrow. Have a super duper fantastic rest of your sneakers day.